Hi everyone and welcome to chapter 13 on the diversity of microbes, fungi, and protists. We spent the first part of this unit talking about the process of evolution and we're going to spend the remainder of the unit essentially looking at the wide range of living organisms that have evolved on planet Earth, starting with microbes, fungi, and protists, then moving into plants, and then finally finishing off with animals. So in this chapter, our main focus will be microscopic organisms, or microbes. Microbes are living organisms that cannot be seen with the naked eye. You need a microscope in order to see them because that's how tiny they are. Just because microbes are tiny, however, does not mean that they are not extremely diverse and complex. Microbes are not one-dimensional. There are actually a wide variety of different types of microscopic organisms, and we are going to walk through in this chapter these different types, which include bacteria, archaea, viruses and prions, protists, microscopic animals, and finally, fungi. And not all fungi are microscopic, but many fungi are microscopic, so we talk about them in this chapter as well. One thing to keep in mind is that some of these organisms here, particularly bacteria and archaea, are made of prokaryotic cells, while others, the protists, microscopic animals, and fungi, are made of eukaryotic cells. Viruses and prions are made of neither type of cell because they're not made of cells at all, as we will see soon. So we're going to divide these different categories of microbes into two groups, the prokaryotic ones, which are bacteria and archaea, and the eukaryotic ones, which are protists, microscopic animals, and fungi. And before we get started talking about these different categories of microbes, let's start with a review checkpoint. Tell me at least one difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic organisms. And again, before we get started, I'm going to go over a few reasons why it is important to study microscopic organisms, because although they are small, that does not mean that they do not play a very significant role in our lives. One important reason why it's important to study and understand microbes is because some microbes cause diseases. For example, Vibrio cholerae is a type of bacteria that causes the diarrheal disease cholera. Klebsiella pneumoniae is a type of bacteria that causes pneumonia. Bacillus anthracis is a type of bacteria that causes the disease anthrax. And these are just a few examples of specific microscopic organisms that result in specific diseases when they infect humans. So understanding those disease processes and how to cure those diseases is one very important reason why microbes need to be studied. As a counterpoint to that, microbes are also important because although some of them are harmful, others are essential for our health. The number of microscopic organisms living on and inside of your body is actually larger than, than the number of cells that compose your human body itself. It is estimated that you have uh, somewhere between 30 and 40 trillion cells, human cells, that compose your own body, but that there are well over 40 trillion bacteria, fungi, protists, all different types of microorganisms that live in this mutually beneficial relationship with your body, and they're absolutely everywhere. They perform important functions, such as assisting in the digestion of your food. They also protect your skin and your organs from the bad microbes, because by occupying those spaces, they prevent the pathogens from taking up residence there and causing infections. And they also help regulate your immune system by training your immune system what counts as a bad bacteria and what counts as a good bacteria so that you don't have overreactions to things that aren't actually harmful to you. 
A third reason why it's important to study microscopic organisms is because they play very important roles in the ecosystems of planet Earth. A few examples of how microbes play roles in Earth's ecosystem include the role that soil bacteria play in capturing nitrogen from the air and converting it into fertilizer for plants. The Earth's atmosphere is actually mostly made of nitrogen gas. About 80% of the gas in the Earth's atmosphere is nitrogen, a little less than 20% is oxygen, and then there are other smaller components such as carbon dioxide. But that nitrogen gas is very important to get out of the atmosphere and down into the soil so that it can be used by plants um, in forms that can fertilize them. And it turns out that soil bacteria are the only type of organism that is capable of taking in nitrogen gas from the atmosphere and transforming it into these fertilizer type forms that the plants can then suck up. Another specific type of bacteria that plays an important role in our lives are cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria are aquatic bacteria that live in bodies of water and especially the ocean. And cyanobacteria are important because they can perform photosynthesis. As we learned previously, one of the products of photosynthesis is oxygen. Oxygen is given off actually as a waste product of photosynthesis. And therefore, cyanobacteria play a very important role in supplying oxygen into the atmosphere and contribute significantly to the amount of oxygen that we breathe today. In fact, it is thought that going back in geologic history, cyanobacteria, much more so than land plants, contributed to the 20% of oxygen that is present in the Earth's atmosphere today. We can thank cyanobacteria for the fact that we can breathe today. A fourth reason why it's important to study microbes is because microbes can give us clues about the origin and evolution of life. We've learned a lot about evolution so far, um, but what we didn't learn is that all life is thought to have evolved from single-celled organisms, which eventually conglomerated into multicellular organisms and developed the levels of complexity that we see in life today. And as we talk about microbes today, we're going to see an example of an interesting type of microbe that can give us some clues as to how single-celled organisms might have evolved and adapted into a multicellular form. And then finally, a fifth reason to study microbes is because we can use them for our benefit. There are countless ways in which humans have been using microscopic organisms to help them with various aspects of their lives including in the fermentation of foods, yogurt, sauerkraut, uh, kimchi, pickles, olives, all of these foods have historically been created and preserved using microscopic organisms or cultures um, which allow them to transform the foods into the form that you are familiar with. Fermented beverages, the same as the case for these, uh, we would not have alcoholic beverages if it were not for microscopic organisms, and especially yeast, a type of fungi which is able to perform this process of fermentation and release alcohol. We can also use microbes in order to manufacture medicines, and this is performed through genetic engineering. Uh, you're probably familiar with the uh, disease diabetes and perhaps also with the hormone insulin, which is actually a drug that individuals who have diabetes may have to take on a regular basis. That insulin is actually made inside of bacteria. And the way that this process worked is humans took the gene for insulin out of the human chromosome and cut it out and inserted it into the chromosome of E. coli cells. And this caused the E. coli cells to begin producing insulin, a human hormone, but it's being made in these bacteria because they're, they received the gene for it. And now these bacteria, which have been genetically engineered this way, are grown in large-scale production vats 
and then the insulin that they produce is purified out of the mixture and turned into the medicine that people use when they have this type of diabetes. And microbes can also be used in the environment for bioremediation, which is another word for cleaning up the environment. For example, when there has been an oil spill. There are types of microscopic organisms out there which actually eat oil. That is their fuel source that they use. They subsist on petroleum primarily. And so these microbes have actually been used in the past for cleaning up oil spills, particularly when those oil spills are located on land. It's really hard to make this successful when the oil spill is in the ocean because the bacteria just kind of float away and um, don't seem to stay localized around the oil spill. But when it's on land, it's easier to keep them in place and easier to allow them to clean up the oil spill effectively. So keeping all of those reasons in mind, we are now going to jump into our discussion of the various different categories of microorganisms. And we're going to start with the prokaryotic categories of bacteria and archaea, which we're going to be talking about together because they are pretty similar to each other, but we will also point out how they are different. Bacteria and archaea, as we said, are both prokaryotic cells, and they are both single-celled organisms, meaning that there are no multicellular bacteria, nor are there multicellular archaea. Every bacteria is just a single cell, as is every archaea. They are also very small, which is a characteristic of prokaryotic cells specifically. They're smaller than eukaryotic cells. And they both reproduce through a process called binary fission, which simply involves splitting in two. It's a very simple process where the bacteria and archaea make a copy of their DNA, and then they split down the middle and clone themselves. Bacteria and archaea come in three different shapes. Bacillus is the name for the first one, and a bacillus-shaped bacterium or archaea is a rod-shaped bacterium or archaea. The one up here that you see, this bacteria is Escherichia coli, which is simply abbreviated E. coli, and these are clearly bacillus-shaped bacteria or rod-shaped bacteria. The next type is coccus, which are sphere-shaped bacteria. A good example that you can see on the slide here is of the Archaea pyrococcus spheriosus, and you can see that these are spherical shaped little cells. And then the third type is spiral shaped bacteria, which uh, you can probably imagine what those look like. So these are ways in which bacteria and archaea are similar. One way in which they are different, however, is that most archaea are extremophiles. And an extremophile is defined as an organism that likes to live in conditions that we as humans would consider extreme. For example, the type of archaea that you saw on the last slide, Pyrococcus furiosus, actually grows best around temperatures of 100 degrees Celsius, which may not sound so bad um, since we live in Arizona and 100 degrees sounds like it's not such a horrible temperature, but 100 degrees Fahrenheit is what we are familiar with. 100 degrees Celsius is actually much higher. 100 degrees Celsius is the temperature at which water boils. So Pyrococcus furiosus, this archaea actually likes to live in boiling water. That is its preferred habitat. So this is what we mean when we say that they are extremophiles. But there are different types of extremophiles. One type is halophiles, and halophiles are archaea that like to live in very salty environments. And when we say very salty, we're talking even more salty than the ocean. The ocean is not salty enough for halophiles. Uh, we're talking something like the Dead Sea or the Great Salt Lake that has a very high salinity content. Thermophiles like to live in very hot environments. So Pyrococcus furiosus would be an example of an archaea that would be considered a thermophile. And then finally, acidophiles like to live in highly acidic environments with a very low pH. In this checkpoint, I would like you to tell me what is the technical term for the shape of the bacteria that we see on the slide here.
And in this checkpoint, scientists semi-recently discovered an extremely salty underground lake on Mars. If they were to find Archaea there, what category of Archaea would they find? So that completes our discussion about bacteria and archaea, the two prokaryotic types of microbes. Now we're going to move on to discuss viruses and prions, which actually we did not categorize either with the prokaryotic or eukaryotic microbes because they are not made of cells. Viruses are a strange sort of biological entity because they're one of the only things in biology that is not made of cells. Instead, they are made of either DNA or RNA as their genetic material, which is surrounded by and protected by a structure called a capsid that is made of protein. Viruses are also strange in that they are one of the only genetic or uh, biological entities where they can actually have the nucleic acid RNA as their genetic material instead of DNA. Viruses are also not actually considered to be really alive. And the reason why this is the case goes back to those eight different characteristics that we studied in chapter one, which were said to unify all living organisms um, in the sense that everything that is a living organism exhibited all eight of those characteristics. But viruses are lacking at least one of those characteristics in that they are not able to reproduce without infecting another living cell. Reproduction was one of the eight characteristics that we studied in chapter one. All living things are capable of reproducing. And while viruses can reproduce and make more viruses, they cannot do so independently. They are completely reliant on the cells of living organisms in order to make more viruses. So in this sense, viruses don't fully fulfill the requirements of being a living organism. Every type of virus out there is capable of infecting certain types of cells, but not others. So let's take a look at some examples. Bacteriophages are a type of virus that actually infects bacteria. And this can be confusing to really wrap your head around sometimes because we kind of think about bacteria and viruses as both being like these tiny, pathogenic, bad microbes, but actually there are viruses that can infect bacteria because viruses are much smaller than bacteria and um, they need cells in order to reproduce. So bacteriophages are a specific type of virus that will only infect and use bacteria as its host. Another example of a virus is human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV. HIV specifically infects cells of the human immune system. Over here, this is a microscopy image of Ebola virus. Ebola virus infects human liver cells, as well as the cells that line blood vessels, which is why uh, bleeding from various orifices and internal hemorrhaging is one of the uh, symptoms of Ebola virus infection. And influenza virus, as you see here, infects cells that line our respiratory system, so the cells that are found in the lining of our lungs and alveoli. And it turns out that the cells that are infected by influenza virus are the same cells that are infected by another type of virus, which is more relevant to us right now, and that is the coronavirus. So I'll just say a few words here about coronavirus as long as we're talking about viruses. Coronavirus can be seen in this microscopy image right here. And as you can see, there are these structures projecting from the surface of the virus itself. Um, these are actually little proteins that stick off of the surface, and they give the virus the appearance of having a crown, which is why it's called coronavirus, because the Spanish word for crown is corona. There are actually seven known strains of coronavirus that can infect humans, and all of them infect the cells that line your respiratory system. Four out of those seven are causes of the common cold. 
there are actually 200 different viruses that can cause what we recognize as the common cold. And a handful of them are coronaviruses, but it turns out that the coronaviruses are actually some of the more popular or prominent causes of the common cold. The other three coronaviruses that have human hosts are Middle East Respiratory System, or MERS-CoV, Severe Acute Respiratory System, or SARS, and COVID-19. So four out of the seven coronaviruses are very mild. The other three are much more severe, and this includes COVID-19. So in this checkpoint, I want you to explain to me, in your own words, why aren't viruses considered alive? And as a follow-up to our discussion about viruses, we're also going to talk about another type of pathogen that is not made of cells, and that is the prion. Prions are similar to viruses in the sense that they too are not made of cells, but they are different from viruses in the sense that they are even simpler in structure than the virus. They are simply made of protein. They are a protein that is able to interact with and corrupt other proteins. So here we have displayed a normal protein, and here we have an infectious disease-causing prion protein. And what the prion protein is able to do is interact with the normal protein and essentially transform it and corrupt it to turn it into a prion protein. And then that prion protein can repeat the same process, and it can go on and on and on. And eventually what happens is enough proteins have been corrupted that it can cause neurodegeneration of the brain. In fact, every prion disease that is known affects the nervous system and um, causes gradual deterioration of the nervous system. Something that's interesting about prion diseases is that they are both inheritable and transmissible, which means that there are prion diseases that run in families and are genetically encoded um, in the chromosomes so that people make these corrupted proteins as a result of what is found in their genes. But those people can also then transmit their corrupted proteins to others and cause them to catch the prion disease, which is kind of crazy because no other diseases really work like that. With other diseases, they are either genetic or they are contagious, and prion diseases are not like that. Some examples of prion diseases, uh, which you may or may not have heard of because they're really rare, include Kuru. Kuru was the first prion disease that was ever discovered among the Foray tribe in Papua New Guinea, which is an island off the coast of Australia. And um, it was recognized initially because this was a tribe where part of their spiritual tradition was to engage in cannibalism of their dead loved ones. But it was discovered that through this cannibalism, they were actually transmitting the prion diseases from person to person and actually... Um, developing this really widespread sickness that ended up needing to be stopped. Mad cow disease is another example of a prion disease that affects primarily um, hoofed mammals, such as cows, and it causes loss of motor control and abnormal behavior. But it can also be transmitted to humans who eat beef or the tissue of cows that have been infected with the prion disease. And in fact, um, when there was a mad cow disease outbreak in England, um, people are, are still so concerned about this mad cow disease outbreak, which happened way back in the 1990s, that people who uh, lived in certain areas and could have been exposed to this infected beef during that time period are still not allowed to do things like donate blood or donate organs because of the potential that they could be harboring these prion pathogens. And then fatal insomnia is another one. That one is exactly what it sounds like. It causes progressively worsening inability to sleep, which eventually leads to death. 
So prion diseases are very rare, but also very nasty. You do not want to catch one. Okay, so now we're moving on to the eukaryotic types of microscopic organisms that we need to discuss, which include the protists, microscopic animals, and fungi. So we will start with the protists. So protists are a extremely diverse group that are all eukaryotic and all single cellular. So they're made of the larger, more complex type of cell that has a nucleus and internal structures, but they're made of only one of those cells. They're not multicellular. Because protists are so diverse, there are actually a wide variety of different subgroups within this protist category, and we'll talk about just a few of them. One type of protists are the protozoans. And what protozoan means is it literally translates to primitive animal. Because when people first saw these guys under the microscope, they thought they looked like tiny little primitive animals. Protozoans obtain their nutrition by eating. So they engulf food particles and they bring them in and digest them. They live in watery environments. And some of them are animal parasites and can be parasites of humans. I'm going to talk here about three of the more major protozoan parasites of humans, one of which is Plasmodium falciparum. This is the protozoan parasite that is the cause of malaria, which is a global pandemic that infects 228 million people worldwide. Malaria is caused when Plasmodium falciparum infects red blood cells which is what you can see going on in this microscopy image right here. We have uh, the red blood cells, which are the large splotches, and then inside of them, these little purple rings are the plasmodium parasite. And what plasmodium will do is it will corrupt the red blood cells and cause them to take on abnormal shapes, in which case they can clog up the organs and the liver and lead to all sorts of different types of organ failure. Another protozoan parasite that you may have heard of is Giardia lamblia. This is actually the most common intestinal parasite in the United States. It's transmitted by drinking contaminated water, and the resulting diarrheal disease is referred to as Giardiasis. This is not something you want to get. Um, my cat had Giardiasis, and it was just a nasty situation to deal with. Trypanosoma brucei is another protozoan parasite which infects the circulatory system. You can see in this image right here, um, we have the red blood cells again, but in this case, the trypanosomes are not inside of the red blood cells, but rather outside of them. And this type of infection causes the disease known as African sleeping sickness. So uh, that was protozoa, which is only one type of protist. And another type of protists are algae. Algae are photosynthetic, so rather than eating to obtain their nutrition, they obtain it from the energy of sunlight. They, like protozoans, live in aquatic environments. And some types of algae are bioluminescent. What that means is that they are able to um, essentially fluoresce or luminesce and give off brightly colored light like these guys that you see right here. Um, these types of algae are called dinoflagellates and what happens is uh, when the water, when the tides rush in and they are disturbed, the physical churning, uh, shearing forces of the tide causes them to give off this brightly colored light. And you can actually look up videos of this happening off the coast of California. And every time a wave crashes, there's just this flash of light as these tiny little algae are projecting their luminescence. Another type of protist are amoebas. Amoebas are known for having extremely flexible bodies and they move as well as eat by projecting these segments of their cell uh, called pseudopods, which literally translates to false feet. You can see the amoeba in this animation right here uh, moving its pseudopods. 
And what amoebas will do in order to eat is they will find a food particle and they will extend a pseudopod out to engulf it and bring it inside so it can be digested. Some types of amoebas actually give us clues as to how the multicellular forms of life could have evolved. And these types of amoebas are called amoebic slime molds. We learned that protists are single-celled organisms. They are made of a single eukaryotic cell. But amoebic slime molds are actually capable of organizing into a multicellular form when they are presented with threatening environmental conditions. So we're going to watch a quick video to see how this happens. So I hope you guys found amoebic slime molds as interesting and bizarre as I do. We are moving on now from protists to the next category, which is microscopic animals. Microscopic animals are exactly what they sound like. They are animals that are too tiny to be seen with the naked eye. And there are a few different categories of microscopic animals out there. First of all, there are the helminths. Helminths are parasitic worms. This includes things like tapeworms, roundworms, what you see on the slide right here, this is a microscopy image of the parasitic worm known as hookworm, which is transmitted through a soil that is contaminated with feces and it's capable of burrowing through your skin in order to infect you. Um, so yes, stuff of nightmares. There are also mites, which are microscopic insects. This includes things like spider mites, demodex mites, which live uh, typically in the human uh, hair follicles, especially the hair follicles of your eyelashes and eyebrows. Here's a little image of a demodex mite right here. And then there are the much, much uh, cuter than the other two and completely harmless water bears, which you can see in Im this image right here, also known as moss piglets. Um, and their official name is tardigrades. So now that we've gone over almost all of the categories of microorganisms, I'm going to pose a checkpoint to you where I want you to identify the specific type of microbe that we're talking about based upon its characteristics. So let's say you are examining an unidentified microbe, which is made of a single cell, and the cell has a nucleus, so you know it is a eukaryote. The organism moves using pseudopods. What type of microbe is it? And in this checkpoint, along the same lines, let's say you're examining an unidentified microbe. It's made of a single cell. That cell does not have a nucleus and the microbe sample was recovered from the inside of a geyser. What type of microbe is that? Mm -hmm. 
Now at this point we are getting close to being finished. We have one category of organism left and that is the fungi. We saved fungi for last because they um, in some ways belong in our lecture about microscopic organisms and in other way, ways they do not because while many fungi are microscopic, as you guys know, not all fungi are microscopic and that includes things like mushrooms. So what are the general characteristics of fungi? Well, they are one of the eukaryotic types of organisms. They can be either single cellular or multicellular. Some species of fungi are composed of just a single cell. For example, this guy right here is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is the type of yeast that is used to both brew beer and uh, bake bread. So this is a single celled type of fungus. Not all types of fungi are microscopic. The multicellular versions tend to be macroscopic. But one thing that all fungi have in common is that they obtain nutrition by absorbing it from their environment. And in this sense, they are not like plants at all. Uh, in fact, if you look at the genetics of a fungus and compare it to the genetics of an animal, fungi are more similar to animals than they are to plants. Plants perform photosynthesis in order to get their energy. Fungi are not capable of photosynthesis and they essentially eat. And usually what they eat is dead organisms. They are major decomposers in the ecosystem. In order to reproduce, they produce these little uh, tiny cells called spores, which we will see in just a second how those spores work and contribute to the reproduction of the fungi. So fungi are an extremely diverse group. Uh, and on this slide, I'm gonna show you a few examples of different types of fungi, which you may have been aware of, but didn't actually know that they counted as a fungus. So the first one that we'll take a look at is a type of mold here known as penicillium. So what we have here is an agar dish containing nutrient material. And right here, this little white fuzzy thing, that is the penicillium mold. And around the outside of it, there are some streaks of bacteria that are growing. But you may notice that there is a halo around the penicillium mold where the bacteria are not growing. And the reason why that is the case is because the penicillium mold is a fungus that produces the compound that we call penicillin, the antibiotic. Penicillin is a naturally occurring compound that was discovered in mold. Um, and essentially, it is a defense mechanism that the mold uses to prevent the encroachment of bacteria upon its structure and its resources. And so we have been able to harvest that compound and turn it into penicillin, the antibiotic, and use it to treat bacterial infections. Another type of fungus is the Saccharomyces yeast that we just saw on the previous slide. Extremely important for baking and brewing. There would be no alcoholic beverages um, that at least that we, that we know of in the United States uh, if Saccharomyces yeast wasn't at our disposal for making that happen. There's also lots of different edible mushrooms and molds. Uh, blue cheese actually contains a type of mold or fungus, which gives it that blue pigmentation. Truffles are another example of a fungus that is considered a delicacy. And there are also pathogenic fungus or fungus that causes diseases. Toenail fungus or athlete's foot is caused by a type of fungus that actually likes to eat the uh, protein keratin. Ringworm, which the name is confusing because ringworm suggests that this is a type of worm, but it's not, it's actually a, a fungus. Ringworm is an infection of the surface layer of your skin with a type of fungus that likes to eat keratin inside of your hair follicles. And the result is this little uh, red area where the infection is taking place. And this infection can actually be treated with topical antifungal creams. So we're gonna step away from our discussion of microscopic organisms here, and we're gonna look at the anatomy of a sort of macroscopic fungus. If you look at a large fungus like a mushroom, 
then inside of that fungus, there are many fibers that are all bunched together, and those fibers are called hyphae. So here in this diagram right here, we can see the hyphae clearly displayed. The mushroom is actually the technical term for the above ground clusters of hyphae, and the mushroom is dedicated to reproduction. The mushroom is the component of the fungus that creates the spores, which are the tiny reproductive cells of the fungus. Below ground, there are hyphae that are called mycelium, and these are dedicated to obtaining nutrients for the mushroom. So kind of like in a plant, we have the roots down here, which in a fungus are called mycelium, and we have the mushroom up here, which is dedicated to reproduction. And underneath the bottom part of the mushroom on its gills is where you find the spores that are the reproductive cells. And fungal reproduction is really strange, so it bears more discussion. Um, and before we talk about fungal reproduction, we need to review how reproduction works in animals or humans like ourselves. We learned that humans are diploid organisms. And what that means is that we have a double set of chromosomes in all of our cells, except for one type of cell, and that is our gametes. The gametes are considered haploid because they only have a single set of chromosomes, and they are dedicated to fusing with other gametes to create new organisms. Our diploid cells undergo the process of meiosis to produce these haploid gametes. And those gametes fertilize in order to generate a zygote, which is a single diploid cell, which will eventually copy itself and divide so many times through mitosis until the organism grows up into the diploid uh, adult form. So that's a review of how things work in animals such as humans. Now let's take a look at how it works in fungi. It turns out that the cells inside of what we might consider the adult form of the fungus, which is the mushroom here, all of those cells are haploid. They only have a half set of chromosomes in them, and so they have the equivalent of a sperm or an egg's worth of genetic information. Through the process of mitosis, not meiosis, they copy their existing cells exactly in order to generate these haploid spores. Haploid spores are very, very tiny, and the spores will fuse with each other through fertilization to generate the fungus zygote, which is diploid, but only for just a very tiny portion of the life cycle is the fungus diploid, because immediately after this zygote is produced, it will undergo meiosis and split into half sets of chromosomes again, and those will grow up into the adult form of the mushroom. So it's essentially kind of like the opposite of human reproduction in terms of the number of sets of chromosomes that are present at any given point in the cycle. So hopefully you guys remember my uh, story about Robert Hooke back in our first unit. He was the microscope guy, um, and he drew, among other things, this image right here of a type of mold called mucor. In this image here, where would we find the mycelium? Would we find it in the area that I've indicated as A, or in the area that I've indicated as B? And then lastly, describe for me one difference between the reproductive processes of animals and fungi. And when you are finished with this checkpoint, you are finished with the whole lecture.